Hi everyone, welcome to Tech Over Coffee. I'm Dave. And I'm Jeremy. We're excited to have you with us. As always, we need to thank Chipola College for this opportunity to film this live podcast at their studio on campus in Mariana, Florida. I mean, Chipola is such a great place, provides many opportunities. You know, that's what's brought Jeremy and I together and even Ben and us together as well. Yeah, I've made a lot of friends here. Yeah, at Chipola, we offer certificates, associates, bachelor's degrees in a variety of topics from technology to accounting to engineering to management. So thank you, Chipola, for the opportunity. Yes, thank you, Chipola. So um, we have some neat topics kind of all centered around Amazon as a starting point. So what do you have for us today, Jeremy? Yeah, I think we're mostly talking about Amazon today. So, uh, I mean, big news is that apparently Amazon is going to be acquiring like empty malls and Sears and places like that to build out more of their uh, distribution centers. So these malls are kind of an interesting place. I, I know growing up, the mall was always a place to be, not as, so, not as much today, right, with uh, everything going on. But those anchor stores, really what drew people in, Sears, I think they're actually what, one of the oldest companies in the history of the U.S. or in the global marketplace, one could say, you know, the Western marketplace, and they're still in bankruptcy. I don't know if they've come out of bankruptcy yet. So well, that is I a, imagine this is part of it, right? They're selling off these properties, and they had to find buyers. So who's the better buyer than Amazon? You know, Jeff Bezos coming in, yeah, I'll buy your, like, 60 million acre properties or whatever. So, right, so the thought of, uh, well said, Jeremy, the thought of these anchor stores, the Amazon is calling them, what, uh, fulfillment centers? They're, they're fulfillment centers. It's uh, these really big, I think uh, some of these are 30,000 square feet, 60,000 square feet, like massive, massive facilities built with, like, conveyor belts and boxes and people going around. And they're essentially warehouses that contain all of Amazon's stuff. But what they're trying to do to, you know, keep this, like, two-day, one-day, same-day delivery processes have all of these fulfillment centers in the areas where people are ordering. So a fulfillment center, I don't even know what that means. That's a fancy word. To, they can kind of do whatever they want. I mean, are they even tracking us right now, Jeremy? Absolutely. I mean, yes. so Amazon is not just reacting. I mean, they're kind of setting the ground rules for how the marketplace is going to work. I know consulting back during that whole dot-com era, Amazon was just one of the players and they haven't just survived, they have become a leader in the marketplace out of that whole you know, click and mortar environment. They didn't even have the mortar, they just had the click, but they had the back end, that whole distribution side. And now, what was one of their main purchases with that mortar side? Well, Whole Foods, right? Yeah, they, they bought Whole Foods, which is a, a big grocery chain. And so they're actually, you know, they're moving from a totally online space to they're actually moving in and buying up retail space. They're competing with Walmart. You know, they're, they're going up against Target and all of these, like, actual physical locations that you go in and see. Well, now you can physically go into an Amazon grocery store and buy your milk. So many neat talking points out of this concept of Amazon and, and their thought of buying these old anchor stores in the malls. So Sears, wow, they're in bankruptcy. I don't know if J.C. Penney, another large anchor store that you hear that it's both of their footprints that Amazon's looking at, at buying up. I think J.C. Penney has fought the... Uh, the goal of liquidating everything. And I know, for example, in Pensacola, JCPenney's is keeping their anchor store, but many other cities, they're giving them up. So I got to think that, you know, they're on the ropes and they're looking for survival. And who knows if someone like JCPenney, I know whenever I go into a JCPenney now, that is some of the best service I've ever received in my life. I don't know if I've ever been in a JCPenney. Should I have said that on air? I mean, is that okay, JC? Uh, I mean, it says a lot about you that you shop at JC. <laughs> Hopefully, it's positive. This but poor it... <laughs> bankrupt company. You're the only one keeping them afloat. <laughs> right. But what's interesting about JC Penney's is they actually they'll kind of point you to the web and different services. So that whole click and mortar, they're doing it kind of reversed. Amazon owns that whole click side, that whole distribution point. So it's it's it, it says a lot about where we're headed. And someone like J.C. Penney's may not survive, but uh, those anchor stores could be something different. Fulfillment center, I guess, like you said, same day we could order it and go pick it up, like you mentioned, Walmart. Yeah. We can go pick it up, so that would give yeah. you the ability to visit Amazon in person. Well, now you also have Walmart partnering with Instacart. This is very new, uh, and so they're actually working on these same-day delivery options. And now Amazon has their entire like delivery system mapped out. They have their own fulfillment centers. They have all of this stuff. Walmart really doesn't have all of that, but what they're able to do is leverage these other companies that are up and coming. 
and sort of like build out this network from you know services that people are already using. Yeah, how competitive is the marketplace today when you look at someone like Walmart and they had to compete and I don't I didn't see it coming. I'm sure some really smart people at Walmart did that you had the Dollar General so that many many type of Walmart in your neighborhood, you know, a block from your house, all of a sudden wow, they had to compete with that and they've they've reacted and now they have to compete with Amazon to survive. So it's really providing yeah. many opportunities for the customer. You mentioned same-day delivery. It's an interesting thing because uh, Walmart for a long time was this big, like, monolith company. There are so many Walmarts. Like, I think the, like, 90% of Americans are within 60 minutes of a Walmart or something like that. So it's a huge number of Walmarts, but they didn't really have that online presence. There's Walmart.com, but it's like Amazon sort of came out and beat them to that. And it's interesting that Amazon's become so big from that that they're able to compete against Walmart in their own turf. You know, go to the, the brick and mortar stores and they're becoming Amazon fulfillment centers. Yeah, I would say before this movement, you know, having uh, Walmart having to compete with Amazon, Probably people I know, myself included, I could count on one hand how many times I went to Walmart.com as compared to people I know myself included that Amazon, how many times, count on one hand how many times you go there in a day, right? So that's a drastic comparison. So Walmart has incorporated that .com, the online presence, much better than they did yeah. in the past. And with Amazon, they've offered their uh, Amazon Prime like two-day delivery for a very long time that like they can charge people for that service. Walmart can't do that and actually compete, so Walmart offers that as a, a free option. So you actually can just go to walmart.com, buy something, they'll give you free shipping just to compete with Amazon. Yeah, I wonder how that'll play out when the footprint is the same and you have these fulfillment centers. Uh, it seems like that ability to include the Prime as a competitive advantage you know, for a trillion dollar company now like mm -hmm. Amazon. Um, I mean, Walmart's not there yet, so I don't know if Walmart would add that. I think there was a period of time within the last 12 months that Walmart was playing with that. I forgot they had a, a name for it, and it was a pilot study. They were trying to provide a prime-type service, yeah. and it failed. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what exactly happened with that. I think they, they end up, you know, Walmart's a big enough company that they don't need to have it as this separate service. They can just roll it into their whole thing. A lot like the uh, grocery pickup service that Walmart does. And maybe that's really where Amazon's trying to compete now because I think Walmart's really pushed ahead on that. Like curbside delivery and pickup is definitely a booming industry at the moment. So if Amazon can compete on that side, uh, it'll be interesting to see if they keep Prime. That might be something that they would do away with. The, uh, the thought of um, maintaining that type of service makes them unique. And the thought of having that whole supply chain, Walmart has that. Um, but with Jeff Bezos, I mean, he's actually so creative. That company that we've talked about in our last time together, and we've talked about offline, uh, Zooks. 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 So, yeah. yeah I'll let you a, say that for that's us. That's okay. So it's a Z O O X, I think, is how Zooks. it's spelled. Okay, that's Zooks. easier to say once I can yeah. mentally picture it. Yeah, it's a. That's I think their uh, AI like self-driving company that Amazon's acquired. So, you know, it's right along with their strategy. Right, and that one's unique because. Zooks is, is one that doesn't outsource from the ground up. They design, and from every um, bolt and, and every uh, piece of the fabrication, they build themselves. So that is quite impressive to go from concept to delivery. So they have a company that's pushing the AI, and if they can incorporate that in their distribution channel to not, at some point, not need a FedEx, not need a UPS. Yeah. Well, I think Amazon's already kind of uh, cut deals with FedEx, where for a long time they were using FedEx as their, like, delivery service, and now they've pushed more of that stuff onto USPS and UPS because uh, I think FedEx is actually this big company and in some ways a competitor for Amazon on their delivery side because, like, if Amazon can cut out those middlemen, they can make that much more profit. Boy, if uh, if Amazon can figure out the distribution channel, I mean, what what is next for them? The thought of uh, if you have an administration, say in D.C. in the U.S. that is open, you gotta think favorably of the U of the U.S. Postal Service has a wonderful history, mm -hmm. you know, it's helped make our country great. But if there's a way to do that better, say, and a company like Amazon could win a contract to manage the mail, I mean, can you see that? It's unlimited to think of. I don't know. Um, Personally, I, I love the sanctity of the United States Postal Service. I it's, do as well. It's one of those like little vestiges of uh, the federal government in every little town out there. Like the library system. Yeah, it's a lot like that. Yeah. It's, it's actually pretty great. And a lot of the problems that the Postal Service has is actually with uh, 
dealing with, I think, uh, pensions and and pay for the people and employees that they have because it's a very good job. It's a federal job, so you get paid well, and it's a matter of how they have to allocate that money. And uh, the actual like logistics service, oh, USPS is great. I mean, you have priority mail three day across the country at any point. That's how Amazon does their two day delivery. It's like Amazon's fulfillment centers and their warehouses are great because they get you your order in the same day to the post office that then delivers it in two days. That's what really gets it done. Right, and, and you could see that um, in those closed door meetings, I would think at Amazon with Jeff Bezos, they're probably saying, boy, if we could control that last mile. Uh -huh. So I'm yeah. sure they're thinking about that. And there is some sentiment to keeping the Postal Service intact. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. With a company like Zooks, they don't, they will not need at some point FedEx or, or UPS. They'll actually be able to deliver it. And when they can work with the FAA to manage mm -hmm. air traffic, that is something that's sure. exciting watching the legislation on that. Yeah. When they open that up and you can have some um, robotics, some UAVs that can deliver packages mm -hmm. to your doors. Think about how I already eat too many pizzas on my – I mean, that's yeah. going to be bad when Drone a robot pizza can delivery, just... that's <laughs> the way to go. You don't have to worry about people. There's no driver. It just boop, boop, drops it in your backyard. Oh, yeah. You're sitting out <laughs> in the backyard. I was yeah, thinking. Perfect. It's too convenient. I, hey, leave a window <laughs> open. It flies in, leaves it on your table, and then flies back out. Oh, That's not boy. invasive at all. <laughs> That's right. Oh. So a great, great topic for us. So um, the thought of Jeff Bezos and kind of adjusting, changing the landscape. There are other leaders like that. Elon Musk is one, and yeah. they're competing now with space. So you look at Blue Origin, mm -hmm. the thought of trying to get these federal contracts. Right. And I know when NASA was looking to get contracts in place to go with this next lunar landing, um, SpaceX was a winner. I think Boeing is trying to catch up right now, which yeah. is kind of reverse. They've Boeing, kind of Lockheed, been left behind. Yeah, they, they've always were the leaders. And so now with this competitive environment and these entrepreneurs really pushing the envelope, Jeff Bezos, I think, is is a player in that environment as well. I guess working. it's it's always a story of uh, the person that's big and that's kind of in charge at the time can kind of become complacent. We're talking about Walmart getting kind of supplanted by Amazon. We're talking about Boeing, Lockheed Martin being uh, supplanted by SpaceX. You have uh, th and the same thing with Tesla and a lot of the like, you know, Fords and GMs, is you have these uh, big leaders of industry sitting on their haunches and saying, hey, we're good where we're at. We, we're the top dogs. We're the best there will ever be. And then someone else comes in and says, hey, we've got a better idea. And then that actually shakes it all up. That's the good thing because then you have, you know, Walmart doing something to make their business better. And you have hopefully Boeing and Lockheed figuring out how to make better rockets. Yeah. Um, boy, Jeremy, it's fun doing this podcast with you because you just lay out a few different things to, to talk about. Um, Everything's the, connected. You can just keep going. <laughs> that's I mean, right. we can make this. A but very we are long, limited by time. Like, very we'll long to, podcast. That's right. We'll have to keep these uh, with, within our parameters. But yeah, just to go off what you just noted, um, the thought of the marketplace. I mean, competition is so great, and that's one thing. The Western marketplace, U.S. in particular, why we're such an amazing environment for business is because of that competitive nature. Without competition, without a free market, you would not have, boy, uh, cars as competitive as they are, as well made. You wouldn't have. Um, Google, you wouldn't have Facebook, you wouldn't have the ability to be on the moon already yeah. to actually explore space. Wouldn't have Amazon in their one-day delivery. Thank you. Yeah, that actually makes it uh, yeah. tangible for our discussion tie, tie today. Tie it all back. <laughs> yes, that's right. Um, you mentioned uh, those that are already established, so that thought of a first-to-market or a late mover, that was something that popped in my mind as well. Um, Jeff Bezos, I think he was kind of back in the day with that whole – dot com era he was a first to market with that thought and he stayed in the forefront being a first to market like apple you know originally with gui and then with their smartphones it is so tough when you're first to market because you have to just stick, keep pushing and pushing yeah. and redefining the landscape and that's not always easy to do yeah to, to stay ahead you have to always innovate and to always innovate you have to take risks and to take risks sometimes you have to fail and the guys on top don't always want to fail you got to kind of you know, keep it steady. And that's that's the story there, right? Where you get Apple that goes and innovates and makes something new and then they get on top and then they have to maintain that position so they can't go too far. And then you have new guys making Androids, doing something new and different. And then you can have this play back and forth that causes innovation. Yeah, it just keeps pushing Apple to, right. to stay as it a leader. It allows them a position to make some risks to, you know, they have to because otherwise this guy's going to beat them. 
Yeah, so the thought of Amazon, bringing it back, as you did well early earlier, Jeremy, thank you for that, um, that they were kind of behind the scenes getting that whole distribution process in place. So now they, they had the luxury of actually targeting what they'd like to target. Um, we were just talking offline, you know, what are they going to look at next? And maybe something they'll look at is, is automotive parts or something they'll look at is pharmaceuticals. I know they've already made a play for pharmaceuticals. But whatever yeah. they decide to target, since they have the distribution point already set behind the scenes, it becomes hard to compete in that space. Mm -hmm. I mean, speaking of pharmaceuticals, I'm not sure if you saw about uh, Kodak. I did. That was very interesting to me. Yes, yeah, so um, I went to a small college in Rochester, New York, and that was where Kodak is established. Mm -hmm. And um, wow, good good for the country when, and good for Kodak that they've still hung on a bit where yeah. they can get a contract like this. Yeah, I mean, uh, the Eastman Kodak Company uh, just got a big deal with, I think it's, uh, it's the first of its kind. Uh, what was it? It's a, a government grant, basically, to uh, or it's a loan. I think it might be a loan. Right. Uh, almost a trillion dollars, something like seven hundred billion dollars, to start producing pharmaceuticals here in the U.S. Like uh, not actual the drugs, but the ingredients to make the drugs, which kind of makes a lot of sense when you think about it, because Kodak, being a film company, worked with chemicals to make film so why not just kind of change it around and that's the thing uh, I think the president or CEO said is that uh, they're really more a chemical company than a camera company they're just known for their cameras and that's a win for any country and just say for us in the US to not have to outsource something so important as the ingredients yeah. for pharmaceuticals to be able to do that in-house if, if things go awry you know pandemics happen unexpectedly to be able to manage those things within your borders is powerful and so to have a Boy, kind of a seminal established uh, company like Kodak to, to get that type of contract and they can kind of come back and contribute. It really, you talk about sentiment. Uh, there's a nice yeah. sentimental value with that. Kodak as well. is uh, definitely what I'd consider like a legacy company. It's been around for so long. Um, it's a little questionable to me when you have like the stock suddenly rise 1,500% in a day or something like that. Are they still publicly traded? Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, on the NYSE? Mm -hmm. okay. they've, they've been out there. They went from, and now a thousand something percent sounds crazy. They went from like $3 to 30 or something like that. I don't know. But uh, they, they triggered, I think, 16 breakers on the stock market. Like they had to like, hey, stop trading this. It's way too volatile. Uh, it's like. It's interesting how that goes because if there are rules and regulations, uh, a stock can only move so far so fast to try to protect people's money. But uh, then you just had uh, a few days, like I think today or yesterday, it dropped 30% because the uh, the loan got paused. It's like, well, we have to do a little bit of checking on this, it's, of course. but. Man, to put that money into Kodak before it uh, goes goes out, which they say the CEO may have done. So I'm gonna kind of set aside that insider trading. I don't know. Right, I won't touch I'm, that one. I'm no uh, like an analyst or anything. So uh, right, we're not registered, right? No. Yeah. So um, I'm kind of gonna set up maybe a topic for next week that uh, something that you may have done and you don't have to admit here on air, <laughs> but to make all that profit with Kodak, that 1,000 percent. And then as you make that to kind of switch it over to Bitcoin, mm. would have been a brilliant play well, in the so middle of the evening. Actually, a while back, uh, Kodak made some kind of licensing deal with some mining company to produce something like a Kodak coin. Uh, it, it didn't go anywhere. It didn't do anything. But it was kind of funny because to then see Kodak come back around and be getting government loans and their stock going crazy, a lot like Bitcoin, is kind of like, oh, okay. So they've been trying, Kodak's been trying to do something new for a while now. So it's kind of cool that they've maybe found their niche. And that's a good primer maybe for us for our podcast, uh, Takeover Coffee next week. So oh, yeah. Jeremy, as always, I could go for days talking with you on this podcast. So thank you, sir. Oh yeah, thank you. I love it. Yeah. All right, everyone. Bye until next time.